every creature unique in the song that is
is deeper than the sea, and His mercy is unfailing, and His arms a fortress for the weak. Let faith
was filled with his praises Wonder when sin I was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is he The word became flesh and light shined among us His glory
Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Today we're going to we're going to we're going to look <laughs> we're going to look over the shoulder of Jesus, okay? Uh, well, he's in the garden of, of Gethsemane. And uh, it's a very, very powerful moment in the life of Jesus, his earthly life, when he's here on earth. So Luke chapter 22, um, starting at verse uh, 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, or agony, as some translations say, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Then verse 47 says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them, uh, without waiting for a response from Jesus, one of them uh, struck the servant of the high priest, uh, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the, and the uh, elders who had come uh, for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. May God have blessing in the reading of his holy word. Blood, sweat, tears, and a healing. Blood, sweat, tears, and a healing. Dave Dervecki was a professional ball player years ago. And he became a Christian and became well known for his Christian faith. And um, he had, uh, as, as his word about his Christian faith became well known and he was uh, healed of a, of a bad arm, um, he got this letter written to him. If there is a God who cares so much for you, why did he allow you to have surgery in the first place? I have lived 41 years in this old world, and I have yet to see any piece of genuine evidence that there is anything real about any religious beliefs. God certainly does not love me and has never done one single thing to express love to me. I have fought for everything I have in life. Nobody cares about what happens to me, and I don't care much what happens to anyone else either. Can't you see the truth that religion is nothing but a crutch used by a lot of weaklings who can't face reality and that the church is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites who care nothing for one another and whose faith extends not to their actions or daily lives but is nothing more than a bunch of empty phrases spotted off to impress others. Harsh. I know this sounds like a pretty negative way to start out a sermon, doesn't it? But I want you to know that's what religion does to people. Notice in that letter that the person writing this, and I don't know if it's a man or a woman, I really don't know, but it talked about religious beliefs and it talked about religion. Jesus came upon this earth and we're reading a story and we're going to be discussing a story today about Jesus and his desire for a relationship with us human beings. It's religion that put Jesus on the cross. Uh, lest we think it's the Roman authorities. It was religion that put Jesus on the cross. Now the Bible does talk about good religion and all that. But it, it always talks about it in light of and connected to relationship. Relationship to God Almighty. Religion kills as the law does, because religion is law, but relationship brings life, relationship with God Almighty. 
And we're going to talk about what Jesus went through to get that relationship established here and that intimate thing that went on in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, one of those Easter stories that, that we read every year and we, we kind of say, hmm, that's, that's uh, kind of interesting, you know, how he sweat drops of blood. I wonder how that works and all this kind of stuff. But we've got to look beyond just the drops of blood or what that symbolized, okay? Reading this passage... You know, I don't know if it hits you like it does me, but it's kind of like reading someone else's mail. Here we are in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's between this prayer, this conversation, this time is between Jesus and the Heavenly Father. Yet yet the, the curtain's pulled back. We're able to peek in and over the shoulder of Jesus and see this thing. I love how the Passion of the Christ, the movie, depicts this garden scene. And uh, I do recommend that movie. Um, I'm not going to say any more about it. Uh, it's a very intense movie. Uh, it's, it was intended to be intense, and I think that's one of the pluses about the movie, to see what Jesus went through for you and me. I think we try to sugarcoat it sometimes, uh, but we need to know the reality of what the high price Jesus paid. But, but here we are. We have this awesome privilege of peering into the very private agony of Jesus Christ as he wrestles with the reality of dying a physical death. This is no small task. You might say, well, he was God. I mean, my goodness, probably nothing for him. But remember, he was in a human body. And if I were courageous this morning, I'd tell you to pinch the person next to you and see if they felt it. (laughs) Don't do it. (laughs) Debbie, (laughs) I saw that. Uh, Physical bodies have the capacity to have pain and discomfort and hurt and things can be broken and, 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 and the pain can almost uh, make you lose your sanity if it's consistent and long, you know, and hard enough. Jesus lived in that kind of a body. Don't think for a moment that because Jesus was the son of God, and he was, believe that, that's a biblical fact, but he lived in a human body. So he had the capacity and indeed felt every single physical pain that is possible when he went through this thing. A lot more pain than you and I have ever experienced. What we've we've experienced is pedidly compared to what he went through. And and so here, here we are. Jesus is well aware of the fact of what was coming. This was not a party for him. Far from it. This was not fun. This was the major turning point in the life of Jesus Christ and, I want to say, the destiny of all Christians here in the Garden of of Gethsemane. Why? Why do I say this? It's because Jesus, in his fleshly body, was fighting the biggest battle of his life and, I want to say, our life too. He was fighting for us. And not just for himself. He wasn't just concerned about his own well-being, although he was well aware of what was in front of him. The word commonly used in this passage is agony. Is agony. Uh, now, in the uh, uh, NIV, what, what word was it that we, that we read? It wasn't agony. Anguish, thank you. Anguish, agony. Uh, kind of basically mean the same thing. But the word agony or anguish... Is taken for is actually when it was uh, the root of it uh, in the New Testament is a, it's a military term. I don't know if you knew that or not. It's a military term uh, that, that is uh, used to describe a severe conflict held at a specific place. That pretty well describes the situation. A severe conflict held at a specific place. So the Battle of the Bulge. It was the Battle of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with the realities that Satan was trying to inflict upon him. Some things, as we look at this, become very obvious as we look at this. And, and, uh, but you can't just fly by. You gotta settle in. You've got, we gotta take a, a, a very slow walk through this thing to see what are these things that God is wanting to teach us because it is in the word of God and we need to know. First of all, what, did we, what do we see? We see Jesus not only understanding this, but he goes to his heavenly father because he needs some extra strength. He needs, he needs some comfort. Uh, he needs time with his father, his Abba father. In the midst of the, this internal war that Jesus was fighting, he goes into prayer and calls upon his Abba 
Father. Abba, Father. Although Jesus was in great pain, pain so intense that he sweat great drops of blood. I'm, I'm talking about emotional pain here. He sweat great drops of blood. He made a decision to draw strength and guidance from seeking intimacy with his heavenly father. Now, at this point, a lot of us will read this and, we'll, and we may begin to think some things that aren't really true about this. Jesus, as you know, was sinless. Um, yet he was tempted in every way, the Bible says, like as we are, yet was without sin. In other words, because he lived in a body, lived on this earth with all of our, the, the sin stuff, um, he was tempted in every way. He had, there was nothing he experienced that you and I have not experienced. Or we have not experienced anything he didn't experience. It's, it's, it's one of those things. So as he's looking here, one of the, he was fighting a real battle here. Just like he fought the battle in the, in the desert when, when he was led by the Spirit into the desert and was tempted 40 days, or was fasted 40 days when he was tempted by the devil out in the desert. So there was, there was a struggle. There was a very real struggle going on here. But it was not a struggle of doubt. It was just a struggle of understanding the, 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 the physical human reality of what was going to go on. I wouldn't even call it fear. Now, there might have been a temptation, but I, I think Jesus wrote that off real quick because fear uh, has torment, and this is not the kind of torment he was, he, was, he was experiencing here. He had trust in his father, and he ran to his father when he knew that he would need all the physical strength he could possibly get as he lived in a human body. Because uh, he, So he ran, he went seeking and depended upon the intimate relationship that he had with his heavenly father. Because uh, Jesus, he understood his heavenly father did not desire to hurt his son. This was not, a, this was not something that God really enjoyed. It was not uh, something that, he, uh, uh, that the father um, enjoyed doing. But the heavenly father understood this is the only way. He understood his father could be trusted to the ultimate. Jesus understood that his heavenly father could be trusted whatever. He understood that his heavenly father's main attribute was love. He loved the father. The father loved him. And that's the way it is. End of story. He knew, no doubt about his father's love. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus understood his father would give his earthly body and mind the strength he would need to endure the agony of the cross that he would be experiencing in just a few short hours. He understood, Jesus did, that accomplishing his father's purpose was more important than fleshly comfort. He understood this. This kind of understanding, people, and this is, this is where we're going to boil it down, this kind of understanding is only possible through an intimacy that is the fruit of a constant, consistent, daily prayer life. Moment by moment prayer life. In verse 39, I want you to, I think we probably, a lot of us probably missed this. Jesus went out as usual. Jesus went out uh, um, uh, as usual to the Mount of Olives, or as was his custom some translation says, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. So, so here we are. Jesus went out as usual. This was a habit Jesus had. He didn't just run to his father in a crisis. You hear what I'm saying? He ran to his father every day. He went to his father every day. He understood that that intimate relationship with God, uh, nothing could replace that. And he didn't wait to, till a crisis to develop that relationship. That's not how relationships work. Jesus didn't go there regularly because he had a thing for olives. An addiction. i got to have my olives today. He went to Olive Grove. I don't know. Probably because there was good shade there from the olive trees. We've seen those olive trees, by the way. And, they, and, and scientists and horticulturalists and all those who know about plants... Uh, they did tests on those trees, and, and some of those trees indeed were alive at the time of Jesus. And so when we went over to Holy Land, we saw those trees and we're thinking, wow, I wonder 
were, if Jesus touched any of these trees or if he walked under the shade of any of these trees. Of course, back then it would probably be a little thing, but you know what I'm saying. That it was, it's an amazing thing to think about when you go to the Holy Land, walking where Jesus walked. Make you want to go? You need to. You need to. You really do. It's a life changer. But I, I, I'm just saying that, that Jesus went there because it was his habit. And he went there because he, that, was a, that was his place, was just him and, alone with him and his heavenly father. And, and he, all this trust, all those things I listed that he, he knew it was Heavenly Father. It's because he had developed that relationship. Sometimes we only go to God when there's a crisis and it's hard to know how to pray because we really don't know him. We don't. How do you pray? Well, you know, that's hard to affirm God and his characteristics and all that. We don't know him. You can only affirm somebody or, or, or have a conversation with somebody, a long conversation, if you begin to know them a little bit. And in this case, a lot, you know, and you get to develop that relationship. And that was the key. It wasn't just this single prayer, people, to help Jesus get through the crisis. It was the foundation, the, the, the planning, the, 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 the thing, the prayer life he had built and the relationship he built with his heavenly father his whole life. His whole life. As usual. As was his custom. Do you have a custom? Do you have a habit of going to Jesus every day? Several times a day? A lot of times people say, well, I've, I finally prayed. It was, it was a, you know, it was at least, you know, I finally prayed. Well, and they use prayer like as a last resort. Instead of a first resource. Instead of a first kind of an automatic thing. And I'm here to tell you, the more you do it, the more it will become apparent. Pam and I had an experience this week. And um, it was it was an interesting thing, and I, I I'm not going to give you all the details, but we were going in the uh, Hastings to uh, to uh, buy a copy of the Passion of the Christ, actually. And uh, as we were going in, we heard the screaming and yelling. Uh, we thought it was a lover spat at first, but it was loud, and uh, it was coming to some cars over in the edge of the parking lot. And to make a long story short, this woman had dropped her wallet and had started to drive out of the parking lot, realized she didn't have it with her, went back, and somebody had picked it up, and, and was, anyway, it's a long story. Um, we had to call the police and all that. It's a very, very, very traumatic thing for this, uh, uh, this woman um, that, that it happened to. So, to, uh, um, of course, she was shook, and she was shaking so bad, she asked Pam, would you please fill out the police report? I can't write, you know, because she was shaking so hard. But at the uh, near the end there, um, we uh, uh, before the policeman left, um, I just felt led of God to say, "Ma'am, I know this is a very traumatic thing. Would you like us to pray with you?" She goes, "Yes." <laughs> so I put my arm around her, and Pam and I, and the lady, and the policeman bowed her heads, and we prayed there in the Hastings parking lot, and prayed God's peace and revelation in her life, and that. That, uh, that we just asked God to work this thing out however he saw best and, and all this but he would minister to the lady in her emotional state and all that and I'm just giving that as an example of, of, of we don't have to wait to pray in church or, or just to pray at a certain time or place we need to be ready at all times and I wish I could stand here before you and tell you I always did that Okay, I, I'm not, not always that quick on the draw, but, but that day it worked, and uh, I remembered. And, and, but it's important for us to do that, because it needs to be a part of our life. It's, it needs to be a part of who we are. It was a part of who Jesus was. He didn't have to think about it and, and kind of say, sheesh, what should I do now? You know, well, maybe I should pray. No, it didn't, like, occur to him. It was his habit. He, he, it was a part of who he, it was his lifestyle. And it needs to be a part of our, our lifestyle. And the point, he turned to his heavenly father. Consistent prayer is so critical to a healthy Christian lifestyle. And I want to say a victorious Christian lifestyle. You know, um, it's not like we're waiting to bail water or waiting to um, uh, pray during a crisis. But we're, we're, we're prepared for the crisis when the next crisis comes. And you know one's coming, Right? You know one's coming. It's kind of the life, the world we live in, okay? So um, I love what Richard Foster, he's, he's, he's been an author that I've been appreciative of for many years. And many years ago, he, 
he, he wrote a, a book about the celebration of discipline, and he's written several books uh, about that. And prayer, of course, is the big, a big part here. But I like the, I'm, I'm just going to read this last uh, uh, paragraph uh, out of his book, an excerpt of his book. He says, the love of the Father, and this is how Jesus saw this, the love of the Father is like a sudden rain shower that will pour forth when you least expect it catching you up in wonder and praise and unspeakable speech. When this happens, do not put up an umbrella to protect yourself, but rather stand in the drenching rain of the Father. Isn't that beautiful? I believe that's what Jesus was doing. He was in an unquenchable rain of the Father in that very intense moment when I know there was conflict and I believe the devil was knocking on his door and, and trying to create all kinds of uh, uh, intense agony before he f- experienced any more physical stuff that was down the road. So he turned to his heavenly father. What's another thing we need to learn from this? It's Jesus had to use his faith as he fully trusted and obeyed his father's will. Yeah, Jesus had to use his faith. This was the perfect example people, of how faith comes to play in a human's life. God himself had chosen to become physically limited by becoming a human being as he became Jesus Christ. That's called the long churchy word incarnation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That was Jesus. In this limited state of existence, when the temptation to quit was certainly looking good, Now remember, Jesus didn't hang out there, but certainly looking good. Jesus placed his faith squarely in the eternal purposes of his heavenly Father, which went beyond his immediate pain. Went beyond his immediate pain. Um, It's consistent. We're consistent. And a lot of times, why, why, why is it sometimes, how often do we, folks, succumb to the presence and the pressures, the pressures of a crisis when it comes into our life we're in and find ourselves compromising godly principles? So, so many times we're controlled by the circumstances instead of us taking authority that's been given to us spiritually and we can overcome those circumstances. We're the ones that are supposed to be in control through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about fleshly control. I'm talking about spirit control. So let me ask that question again. How often do we succumb to the pressures of the crisis we're in? Think of Jesus. But we find ourselves compromising godly principles because of the pressures. Now, we love... For example, we love to come on Sundays and, 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 and all that, you know. But when we encounter struggles in life, we don't um, always carry through to obedience. See, Jesus was going to carry through to obedience if it's the last thing he did on this earth. And guess what? It was. He obeyed as the last thing he did upon this earth. So, although Jesus was sweating drops of blood, his spiritual commitment and his faith went deeper than his pain. And it took him to obedience. The faith went deeper than his pain and it took him on to obedience. Do we get the picture here? We get the picture? Just know God can relate to your pain. A lot of times we put God, God is uh, God Almighty. He is Jehovah he is Yahweh. Uh, he, he is all that and so much more. We're just barely scratching the surface of understanding who he is. And because of that bigness of God that a lot of us uh, you know, get a, get a, can get a handle on, we have a hard time understanding that he can relate to our pain. And that, that, that he came in the flesh. And that we need to um, uh, do things the way he did them. Place faith and trust in God and, and hang in there and be, be totally committed to his purposes. And let our faith go deeper than any pain that we can feel. Because God's there. God's there. You might think, you know, there's certain things that I'm experiencing. Nobody else is. God's there. 
You know, no matter how deep the emotional pain gets, no matter how big the conflict, God is there. And thirdly, in spite of the immense, intense agony that Jesus had just been through and also knew what was before, that it was coming, he demonstrated selfless compassion upon a man who lost his ear. Now, it's an interesting little tidbit here. Not a tidbit to the guy who lost his ear, for sure. Major deal, but, but here Jesus is. They're coming to arrest him. He's getting all this. There's nothing surprising Jesus here. And he's already had a wrestling match with, with uh, the devil in the garden. And here they are coming to arrest him to go through a false uh, trial, a biased trial, and, and all the pain and torture is going to come with that. And if it's you or I, if it happened to me, I'd, I'd be really preoccupied with that. And, and these guys come up to arrest me. Um, I'm just, go with this just a minute, okay? Come up to arrest me, and I see that guy's ear cut off. I say, oh, serves you right. You know what I mean? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Good job. But no, Jesus' compassion, the thing that led him to the cross, was in play, even at that point in time. And he wasn't out for vengeance. Jesus had an assignment and was to die for the sins of the whole world. And he wasn't going to let that deter him from being who he was, the loving God who was to die upon the cross in just a few hours. See, Jesus, if nothing else, he was full of compassion. He was full of a lot of good things, but compassion right up here. The love of God. The love of God. There was no way he could have gone to the cross if he didn't have that much compassion and love for us. He would have backed out in a, in a minute, just like you and I would have. You know, what? I can't do this. This is too much. And I believe that's some things, maybe that just using holy imagination, the devil may be whispering, was whispering in his ear in the garden of Gethsemane. This is too much. No man can do this. Nobody can do this. It's too much. Don't even try. We're pretty familiar with that voice, aren't we? Whispering lies in her ear. You can't be successful in your life after all you've done. You can't be forgiven. You only have what it takes to be a minister. You don't have what it takes to be successful in life. You're nothing but trash. You're junk. You messed up too much. Those are the lies of the enemy, people. Don't you believe it for a minute? Listen to the right voice. Tune that one out. And tune in to Jesus, who says, You can do all things through me, because I'm going to give you the strength. I died upon the cross for you because you were worth it. And if it was for nobody else, it was for you. And I'm giving you power to, be, to, to, to conquer every battle that you're ever going to face. I love the positive voice a whole lot better, don't you? The encouraging voice. The voice of truth that comes through, the truth that comes through this word that we hear in our hearts when well, we're a consistent prayer. When we pray to God consistently, we feel that in ourselves. And that's where the strength and encouragement comes. And that's where the strength and encouragement came through with Jesus Christ as well. The same power that came and enveloped Jesus and helped him to go through to the ultimate act of obedience, dying upon the cross for us, is the same power available to you and I. Well, Brian, how can you say that? It's because if you've got Jesus in you, come on now. You can fill in the blanks, right? If you've got Jesus in you, you've got that same power because Jesus is in you. He didn't get any simpler than that. He didn't leave us hanging. He didn't leave us out in a boat without a paddle. Puts us in a boat and gives us his Holy Spirit motor. All right, well, 
That's kind of a bad illustration. But anyway, you get it, right? You get it. He gives us everything we need for life and godliness and victory. And when things happen to us, we know where we can go. Excuse me. <laughs> so, folks, here's Jesus showing compassion to a man that had more than an earache. He lost the thing. And Jesus reached down and performed a creative miracle, putting that ear back on just like it had never been hacked off. And I've often thought about what, what went through his mind. The guy who had the ear cut off, what went through his mind? I, I would just think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm switching sides. <laughs> you know? I, I don't know. That's, that's just one of those things that we'll, I guess we'll, well, I guess we'll, we'll know in heaven. So you can go up and ask him. <laughs> ask him face to face. What went through your mind when your ear was cut off? And he said, first of all, it was a lot of pain. Then I felt a great relief as the Savior touched me. This is, I, I believe, people, this was but a small object lesson describing what would happen upon the cross. In just a few short hours, healing follows agony. In just a short time, we would see Jesus. Hanging upon an instrument of torture, the cross, and one of the most extreme torture techniques known at the time and still known today and knowing it was the only way to gain our salvation would, die, would be to die for us to bring total healing of mind, body, and spirit. Real sickness of our soul would be overcome as Jesus Christ, the light, overcomes the darkness. In the last half of verse 53 it says, this is your hour when darkness reigns, which described the agony, described the torture. But Jesus knew this wasn't the end. He could look at them with all the confidence because he had a relationship with his heavenly father and he and the father are one. And he'd say, you guys, you're not going to be able to kill me. Oh, I, I might be dead for a few days, but I'm here. I, I've already won. I just got to go through the physical stuff to get there. But this, this game's already won. And there's nothing you can do that's going to circumvent God's plan for humanity, for all of humanity. Because those people up in the 21st century are going to need my salvation. Those people that attend Grace Christian Fellowship. Because I love them people. And he mentions other churches too, by the way. But he loves us. He loves us. There's no greater expression of love than what he did. I don't care what you're talking about in all of history. The cross proves to us that he loves us unconditionally. He loves us unconditionally. Why was this? Full submission to the will of the Father led to victory. Full submission to your heavenly Father, to Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit will lead to victory to you too. For you too, for me too. Full submission will lead to victory. Sometimes we get so caught up in the battles and the challenges of life, we get blinded to the truth, don't we? We, we often can't see beyond the immediate battle that we're fighting. Just like Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus on the, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was able to look beyond that. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You know what that verse says? He was willing and able to endure the cross, but he saw beyond the cross. He saw beyond the cross to the results of what the cross was going to bring. And that joy 
What joy was that? Was it joy that he was able to raise her to the dead and he was over the pain now? No. The joy of paying the price for salvation for all mankind because he lives for us. He, li he died for us. He lives for us. He created the way of, of salvation. And that brought him joy because he loves us so much. In 1815, British troops under the, the Duke of Wellington went to battle against the French forces of Napoleon. The English people waited for news of the battle to be sent across the channel. A quick means of communication at that time was semaphore, visual signals using colored flags. I probably pronounced that word wrong, but who cares? Observers along the English coast watched the ships coming up the channel for any word of the battle, where they would signal from the ships whether they won or lost. Finally, a watcher cited a message being waved from a passing boat. Wellington defeated. But then a heavy fog closed in. The words were sent across England, and the nation was plunged into gloom. When the fog cleared, another ship waved the same exact message, this time without interruption, because it wasn't fog to block the view. It said this time, Wellington defeated the enemy. Wellington defeated the enemy. England's sorrow was suddenly turned to joy. At another time in history, people, the cross of Calvary appeared to be a crushing defeat. Christ had died and his followers had been plunged into a fog of despair. Then early Sunday morning, the fog lifted at daybreak. Jesus had risen from the tomb. The message of the crucifixion could be clearly seen in the brightness of the resurrection. It was a victory and not a defeat after all. Well, the devil had a heyday during those three days, you can bet. But he had no idea what was coming next. He didn't know what was going to happen on Sunday morning. Folks, we're, we're here in the Easter season and we're here to celebrate. And here's the invitation for us during this Easter season. Praise team, come on up. Got a couple questions for you today. Feel like giving up? Who hasn't at some point in time? Some of you here today might feel that way. Let me tell you in the strongest possible terms, don't. Don't give up. Trust God and the purpose and the power of the cross through Jesus Christ. If you have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you've never recognized that He is the one that has is, that is bought the victory for you, that has redeemed you, our, our focus on Easter, and is really the focus of all of life, is redeemed. He is the one that redeemed you. If you've never realized that or made it personal, if you don't have a personal relationship with God Almighty, today is the day. The Bible doesn't recommend, and I don't recommend, that you put it off. In fact, the Bible is pretty emphatic about it. It says, today is the day of salvation. And what do you have to do to be saved? A lot of people say, well, I've got I've to get my life straightened up a little bit. First, I have to get some things taken care of. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me think about it for a little while until I can figure this thing out. Well, first of all, you'll, you'll never be able to get, feel like you're good enough. And then you'll never be able to figure it out. Because the grace of Jesus Christ is like beyond imagination. Grace means we get what we don't deserve. So don't wait around getting to the point where you finally deserve it. It'll never happen. When we recognize that we're imperfect, sinful human beings. But God provided a way for us to experience eternal life. And that life is in His Son, Jesus Christ. Who died upon the cross willingly. 
Don't make the mistake that some people make thinking that human beings took his life from him. That is not true. He willingly laid down his life. He chose to die. Why? Because he knew and his father knew that was the only way that we could experience eternal life. It's through the death, the shedding of his blood, the death that he died upon the cross. And then he raised from the dead to give victory over death. You don't get any better than that, literally or spiritually. So please stand with me. I want every head bowed and every eye closed this morning because we got a serious decision to make here. We've talked a lot about around this church about appointments. I believe this morning we all have an appointment with Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is asking us to draw near to Him. If we're a Christian, we're asked to draw closer to Him than, we've, than we were when we walked in the doors of this place. If we don't know Jesus Christ at all as our personal Lord and Savior, we may know Him as a figure of history, but we don't have a personal relationship with Him, then now's the time. Because that's salvation. That's the, today is the day of salvation. And that's what it means. Salvation means we have a right relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to ask for a raise of hands for those who want to make sure their relationship with Christ is right. And we'll pray a prayer this morning, helping you to get that breakthrough that you need. You can't go to heaven without Jesus. You can't go to heaven until you recognize and receive the gift of forgiveness that Jesus is offering through his death upon the cross. So don't think you can get to heaven by your goodness. There's a hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? I want to make sure that you're right with Christ. That you're right with Christ. That you want to make 100% sure. You don't have to walk around in doubt, hoping that the day you die that you're going to go to heaven. You don't have to walk around wishfully thinking that you're going to go. You can know that you know that you know. So put your hand up if you don't know that you know. And we'll pray. Okay, I see that hand. Anybody else? Want to join these who have been courageous enough to raise their hands? Anybody else? To make sure today, right now, this day, that you are a Christian. All right, let's all pray this prayer together. And I'm going to encourage those or ask those that have raised their hands to pray this prayer. And we'll join you. And this is also an opportunity for us who are Christians to recommit our lives to Christ. To rededicate our, ourselves to Jesus and following him as his faithful disciple. So let's all pray this together. Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank you so much. Thank you so much. For your word. For your word. In which it's clear. In which it's clear. That you love me. That you love me. And you died upon the cross for me. You died on the cross. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. Thank you for paying the price. And right here and now, right here and now. I confess I'm a sinner. Confess I'm a sinner. I confess I've blown it. Confess I've blown it. But I've gone my own way. I've gone my own way. And I am sincerely sorry for that. Sincerely sorry for that. And I turn from my sin. I turn from my sin. Turn to you. I turn to you. And I give my life to you. I give my life to you. Forgive me of all my sin. Forgive me of all my sin. Come into me. And help me to walk in faithfulness as your disciple for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand for his grace, and his mercy, and his love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.